busted their backs all day long building houses they could never afford to live in or repaving perfectly serviceable roads in neighborhoods way across town. They arrived in groups of three or four, drank a pitcher of beer among them, and maybe shot a game of pool before hurrying home in time for supper. It was always one of them who dropped the first nickel in the jukebox. The Mexicans usually played records by the local conjuntos like Santiago Jimenez or Trio de San Antonio or maybe one of the big mariachi bands from Mexico with blaring trumpets and a singer with a voice to match. Songs about the black-eyed girl they left behind in the beautiful mountains they would never see again. Fine. Sad songs in a language that he barely understood were easy enough for Doc to tune out. He knew some of the melodies by heart and hummed along when he was in the mood. But when one of the redneck boys lurched toward the box, fishing in his wranglers for a nickel, the hair stood up on the back of Doc's neck. He knew it was only a matter of time before one of these pecker woods bellied up to the Wurlitzer and punched in N26. Now you're looking at a man that's getting kind of mad. Had a lot of luck, but it's all been bad. Fuck me, Doc grumbled under his breath. <laughs> He'd spent a lot of his life in bars all over the South, and it never fucking failed. If you sat there long enough, some asshole would play a Hank Williams record. <laughs> Old Hank dead and buried beneath six feet of rusty red Alabama dirt for the better part of a decade now, still taking their nickels and making them cry. Doc looked around the room. There were construction workers, warehouse hands, soldiers from Fort Sam, and layabouts on disability. They ranged in age from their early 20s to 70-something, but they all loved Hank. They loved him when he was alive, and now that he was dead, they loved him even more. Even the Mexicans loved the son of a bitch, even though most of them couldn't understand what he was singing about. Hank's songs were their very own trials and tribulations set to a rock-steady beat that they could dance to. Each and every one believed that old Hank was singing to him individually, or at least exclusively to people like him, regular folks with kids to raise and bills to pay, most of them overdue. They had no way of knowing that at this very moment, somewhere across town in solid old money Victorian houses in Almas Park and Alamo Heights, doctors, lawyers, and politicians were mixing themselves highballs and cranking up the tank on their high fives. Well, they had plenty of Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole records on their automatic changers, but when they were drinking, only Hank would do. And there wasn't one of them who would pay a dime to hear any other hillbilly singer in the world. Doc didn't wonder why they all insisted on doing this to themselves. He knew what was getting ready to happen. When one of Hank's records dropped into place on an automated turntable, even the initial rumble of the needle in the well-worn groove sounded lonesome. The crying steel guitar was the bait, but it was the beat that set the hook. And by the time Hank's voice crackled from the speaker, it was too late. There was no escaping now. No matter how I struggle and strive, I'll never get out of this world alive. Jesus Christ, that voice, that gut-riching, heart-rending wail that got down in your bones like cold, wet day. The keening of a hillbilly banshee heralding imminent doom. That's enough, goddammit, Doc shouted out loud, but only a handful of patrons paid any attention, and none of the regulars even looked up from their beers. They had all witnessed outbursts from that crazy old man who sits at the table in the back of the joint, but they could never make heads or tails of what he was going on about. He just does that, they whisper. Talks to himself sometimes. Doc pried his fingers loose from the edge of the table and propelled himself through the door and out into the street. It was hot and dark and quiet. The, streets lights, the street lights cast elongated shadows on the empty street, out of kilter trapezoidal ghosts of shadows, I'm sorry, out of kilter trapezoidal ghosts of simple one and two story structures that had housed respectable businesses. The pawn shop was a barber shop once, a place where people gathered to trade neighborhood gossip and tell tall tales. The abandoned building across the street was a family-owned hardware store, bins filled with shiny new fasteners and fittings of every description, wing nuts and carriage bolts and ten penny nails. But like Doc, the buildings were derelict, has-beens, 
shadows of their former selves, waiting around for time to take its slow but steady toll. The familiar fall of faltering footsteps follows behind him. The shuffling echo ceases abruptly each time Doc breaks his stride, but he knows from experience that if he turns around, he'll see only his own shadow stretching from sidewalk to sidewalk like a black chasm opening in the middle of the street. So he just keeps on walking and the ghost follows him all the way home.